Hello, and welcome to my show. My name is Brett. This is my channel on all the things, YouTube, Twitch, Periscope, wherever you're watching me from. And I'm here every Thursday, have been for years, except for a few holiday exceptions. And I take your questions. Sometimes I have guests, sometimes I don't. This week, it's all about your questions. It's course Q&A time. I've got the four courses on Udemy. Some of, some of you have probably taken one of them or more. So thank you for buying those courses. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I thought I would dedicate this week's show to just what questions are people having while they're learning. And maybe you've moved beyond the courses. Maybe you've taken my courses and you've changed your career like so, so many people have. And you're now focused on DevOps and you've got a new problem and you want to talk about it. So throw your questions in chat. I work through them kind of in order that they come in. and while we're talk while we're all getting our questions in and bringing up topics that you're interested in hearing from me about uh, i'm going to go through some news this week some things i've seen uh specifically focused around docker and cncf and container stuff right obviously tons of things happen every week and you can follow all the other news feeds everywhere else so i'm going to talk about what i know about <laughs> the communities that i'm in um but first i want to thank all of you that are patreon subscribers. So the way you sponsor this show now, support this show, is on Patreon. You don't actually have to sign up and give any money. You can buy me a coffee every month if you want some exclusive benefits and stuff there. Thank you to all the existing patrons. But um, what you can do there is just click the follow button. And that'll once you sign up for Patreon, you'll essentially get only my content updates. So things I'm creating, when I have this show scheduled, who's going to be on the show, when guests are going to come, stuff like that. It's, it's barely even one a week. So uh, it's not a ton of stuff. It's basically only the essentials. And so you can sign up there. Uh, the link's down below, also up above on my website. If you're not a part of our Discord server, by the way, you should totally get that. That's also a top here at devops.fan. If you go click that you, or type that in your browser and it'll take you to a, a Discord server invite to our Discord chat. Yes, I still have the Slack chat with over 36,000 people in it. Um, who are taking the courses and asking questions, but a lot of us have moved over to Discord because it's just a little more fun and it's a little less work. <laughs> it feels a little bit less like work, at least. So um, you can still find a lot of help in the Slack as well in the course Q&A, like always, but um, a lot of us hang out and spend our days in Discord um, more, at least for me, uh, in, in Discord rather than Slack as much. Although, you know, great, granted, I have Slack open all day too. So, um, Go check those out. All right, a couple, couple, couple pieces of news real quick before we get to it. Um, first, you know DockerCon is coming. You've probably heard that news. So you just go to dockercon.com, uh, the sign up link. It's free. Just pre-register. Then you'll get the emails about what's coming, what's happening before. I am lucky enough to be a part of the team for putting on DockerCon. So I will be hosting part of the event and you will see me live at DockerCon on multiple occasions <laughs> during that day. Um, we're still working through all the ideas that people gave feedback from last year, uh, and I'm, I'm excited to be a part of it again this year, so I will see you there. Uh, next up, starting in April, the CNCF Ambassadors, which is basically, um, they're kind of like Docker Captains, but for all container tools, right? They're ambassadors of a lot of the open source, as well as some closed source tooling in the CNCF ecosystem cloud native. Uh, and the cool thing was is some of the organizers between the two, Docker and CNCF, got together and created this new series called Container Garage. So there's a blog post up on Docker. I will send you the link so you can read about it. But it, basically, it's going to be container-focused live events. Um, well, I think, yeah, there's some live and there's some talks. Basically, they're going to be short. They're not going to be full-day events. They're going to be three, four hours, something like that. And they're going to be focused around certain topics. So I know that the first one's going to be about container runtimes. And then there are other topics like ideas around images and security. And you might just see me there too. Who knows? But definitely check that out if you have time in your schedule to learn some new container tooling. Um, that will be there. I put that in, in the links. Also, Docker recently enhanced Docker Hub. So that's good because we always want more features in Docker Hub. And if you're using Docker Hub, they have a new interface now for managing old images. So you can actually clean up maybe old tags, old um, 
SHA hash essentially things that basically you're not using anymore. So for example, uh, you know, when you push a new image of latest, that's a, that's a tag, right? A tag of latest. And you push that, the old one doesn't technically go away. It's still around in its SHA hash form. It's um, digest, as we call it in container land. So that digest is there uh, and it hangs around. So now they have this advanced thing where you can actually go and look at old images. I actually have some examples that I can th go through later because if we get a chance, I'd also like to talk about all the stuff I'm working on for the courses. So I've been spending the last couple of months getting all the images ready for the Apple M1, enhancing the Raspberry Pi support, basically allowing all ARM devices to run through my courses. And that has been an ongoing request for the last few years. But now, now that we have AWS servers called Graviton, where you can run ARM devices. Now, Apple has ARM devices and Windows now has Windows on ARM tablets. And we know, you know there's just ARM is getting everywhere. So we need, we need better image support so you can run through my courses on one of these devices and not hit weird errors like you currently do. So that's a big thing I've been working on. And I would love to show you some of the progress in case you're interested in that. So speak up if you are, and we can go through that. Uh, I will post this thing about the advanced image management. Um, no, I think the advanced image management is only for paying customers. Yeah, for pro and team users. So if you're paying the $5 a month to Docker Hub, you can uh, basically go back and clean up your space usage and stuff like that. Old, old tags you don't need anymore, stuff like that. All right. Um, let's get to some questions. And then if we have some time, I'm always happy to jump into demos and maybe uh, show what I'm working on here, what I'm working on. Hello to everyone. Congrats, Pyro, on making your first live show. <laughs> um, course about course updates. What is a new update coming? I am new to Docker. Okay, so the, course, the courses themselves get fixes or enhancements every few months anyway. Um, so when I, there is no single update, I don't release giant updates usually. So the, the next thing that's happening right now is a lot of, it's a lot of behind the scenes, behind the scenes work. It's about updating the images, like I just said, to work on ARM devices in case you're one of those that has one of these new uh, ARM devices rather than Intel. Because when the course was released over three years ago, Intel was really 99% of everything. And over these last three years, we started to see it show up in the cloud. We've got more powerful Raspberry Pis that can now do 64-bit. We now have ARM computers all moving to be ARM in the next few years. So, uh, and we have Windows laptops. You can do ARM now. We, we, we had technically had that a decade ago because I had one of them. I had the original ARM Surface, but it kind of sucked. So nobody used it. Um, but now they're getting more powerful. They're getting better. They got new Snapdragons in the Windows computers that are uh, still not quite as good as Intel, but are... Um, Still more, you know, still more performant than they were just a few years ago. So I think that we're on the road to all that. So I'm doing that as well as fixing some outdated code and security fixes in some of the repos. So if you're in the courses, make sure you do a git pull on your course repo content. So you get the latest commits of all that stuff. And then after that, uh, the video updates that I was kind of in the middle of, but shifted gears a little bit to fix some of this stuff, especially for Apple, um, was new versions of the install videos, which once you get past the install, you don't care about those. So that's not going to be terribly important to most of you. And then there's some fixes in the Kubernetes stuff that I want to do for Kubernetes 118 and newer, specifically around the kube control run command, which I'm going to still teach people the run command, but you rarely are ever going to use it in uh, real world situations because your applications will need YAML files and you will not use the run command for YAML files. But anyway, there's little, little stuff like that. Now, eventually, there will be new videos in the Docker Mastery course, as well as in the Kubernetes course. Both of those are getting new sections. Uh, I just don't have dates for that because there's a lot that has to happen between now and then. So, um, but if you're on my Patreon, hate to, hate to pimp that again, but if you go to the Patreon, you sign up, then you won't miss a beat there. Uh, if you're in a course, you will get course update emails from Udemy. Uh, but sometimes those get marked as spam or you don't see them because if you're in a lot of courses, you get a lot of Udemy email. So if you sign up for the Patreon, you'll also get them from there because I don't send Patreon emails very often. So you will definitely see those. Great question. Thank you. 
Uh, let's see, what's next? Uh, let's see, Sai. You create a service and expose a port. I can't access the application via browser. I'm using cube control port forward to access the application. Also, when we say DevOps, people only ask questions about cloud, nothing about KAs. Or... Um, all right, so I'll answer, the, I'll answer the first question, or at least try to help you. So it, the, uh, there's a lot that depends on there. For your browser to be able to hit a Kubernetes service, my first question is, what service type are you using, right? Are you using a node port? Are you using a load balancer? Or, you know, the, the service type matters. And then what are you using to run Kubernetes and where is it running? All those things affect how you can access it from a browser. I typically don't bother with port forward just because if we're talking about local Kubernetes on my local systems or maybe a machine in my house that I'm learning on, or even the machine, machine in the cloud, uh, my, you know, I want to publish that. I want that to be exposed on an external port available to me. So to me, the port forward is something that I do in troubleshooting usually, but I don't normally do that unless maybe it's some production system that I need to test some backend service that's not normally available to me. Um, so yeah, those, a lot of those depend. So you would have to basically describe where do you have it installed? I'm assuming the browser is the browser on your local machine. You know, what's the URL you're trying to use to get to that machine? Um, yeah, what type of service are you using? Can you, can you jump into an exec in the command line and actually connect from a pod? Can you run a pod inside of that namespace and talk from that pod to the service? You should be able to curl that service by name from another pod. Do you have core, um, the DNS server, whatever, whichever DNS server you've chosen inside your Kubernetes cluster? Because DNS inside the cluster is required if you're going to try to access a service by name. Anyway, there's, there's lots to troubleshoot there. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not, there's no single answer to your problem. But hopefully that'll give you some tips on where to find where that problem's at. All right, next up. When we say DevOps people only ask questions about cloud, nothing about K8s or CI, CD, or anything else. Uh, is that a question? So DevOps is not a tool, right? So DevOps is a series of ideas and human processes and sort of goals for a team for achieving things like Mon better monitoring and measurement of all your things, um, automation to improve the speed at which you can deploy, and a set of practices that involve tools like Kubernetes and Docker and whatnot. Those, all those tools help you essentially get to the goals of DevOps, which is deploying code faster, recovering faster. You know, there's a bunch of acronyms around recovery and uh, speed at which you can deploy, speed you can recover from errors, speed you can, uh, if you have a failed deployment, you actually roll back to the previous deployment. There's all these sort of metrics that you should be tracking, and that's really what DevOps is. But we, you, we, we misuse the word DevOps for everything. It doesn't mean anything anymore because everyone uses it for everything. It's the title of jobs. It's We label tools with DevOps tool, and there's really no DevOps tool. There are automation tools, there are CI tools, there's orchestration tools, there's container running tools, to, you know, container management tools. Uh, there's cloud infrastructure tools. Those tools, any of those tools could all be used to aid you in your DevOps goals. So I'm not sure if that helps answer your question, but yeah, I think the problem is defining what DevOps really is. And Kubernetes is not DevOps. You can use Kubernetes in a way that will help you benefit and gain your, your DevOps goals for your teams and your organization. But the, you can also use Kubernetes for the exact opposite. You can use it in a very brittle, fragile, manual way that's prone to error and breaks often. You can totally do that with Kubernetes if you do it wrong. So if you look at my courses, I teach the courses from the idea that this needs to be repeatable, needs to be measurable. Um, and so I teach it from a DevOps mindset, but you, you, will, you won't see me like list Here's all the DevOps tools you have to learn, right? Because <laughs> I don't really think that 
that's the right approach. So if you're interested more in the, that discussion about you know, like, what is DevOps and what do I consider DevOps tooling, I actually have a link, uh, brett.show slash DevOps, that kind of goes into my background and how, you know, I've been doing this stuff since before it was called DevOps. So sort of my opinions on all that. Also, if you're, if you're still thinking, if you're still learning about the ideas of what DevOps is and the, how you implement the ideas of DevOps, regardless of the tools, ignore the tool names for a second, um, go read the DevOps handbook. Okay, because the DevOps handbook is probably the, one of the original tombs of information that we all refer to when we want to talk about the ideas of implementing DevOps in a team, rather than saying, go learn Jenkins, because that, that focuses on the tool. But if you don't have the ideas of what you're trying to go for, then the tool can be misused. You can use all these tools for good or for bad in DevOps. Um, so maybe that helps. I'm not sure that helps um interview questions so yeah um interview questions that would that would maybe be in my in a different course just because i'm teaching my my courses tend to teach tools so a i'm not you know i'm not teaching you how to be a devops engineer um, but I have, I have been working on this last year on a course about just the DevOps principles and taking it from a higher approach, a higher level approach, not from a tools approach, but from a concepts approach and the processes and the methodologies for implementing DevOps. And I've been working on that with a friend of mine. And that would be, I think, a great idea to put into that course. And I definitely appreciate that feedback um, because that is more about the theories of DevOps which to me are way more important than, do you know this Docker command, right? Because I can teach you a Docker command. I can tell you to go research a Docker command. But if you don't, if you don't understand the theory of, around cloud native design and of, around distributed computing and around DevOps, these are, the, these are the foundations that allow you to execute really great teams and workflows. So go look up cloud native. There, go look up O'Reilly books. Uh, cloud native, distributed design, and DevOps principles. Those three ter terminologies are super critical, I think, for the modern developer, the modern DevOps practitioner, the, including operations people. And I'm a sysadmin at heart. I really love the ops side, the sysadmin side. And I think that's just as important for those people to, to know that as well. So yeah, that stuff I'm definitely putting into the ideas of a new course. I don't know when that course is gonna launch. We haven't even started recording yet. So, uh, but thank you for that feedback. I agree. How to start with Helm, any reference links? Well, obviously there's a documentation, um, but install Helm on your machine. If you're on Mac, you use Brew, uh, go to the Helm documentation, it shows you how to install it. And then just l go find something you're interested in. Go find, you know, do you care about replicated databases or do you wanna, you know, implement Jenkins with a Helm chart or something like that? Just go find a chart that you care about and then use Helm to install that. And then use Helm to manage that. I, th I learned by doing. So I would recommend that you take something that you're interested in and then you implement that with Helm, either by finding an existing chart at first, right? Finding charts. And then maybe eventually you might get, you might try to create your own charts. But honestly, to get started with Helm, it's, it doesn't require that you understand how charts work. You don't really need to know how to build them. You just need to know some basic Helm commands. And the nice thing is, is nowadays you can just run Helm commands against any Kubernetes. So you can run Kubernetes locally, you can run Kubernetes in a, on a cloud setup. You don't even have to be a Kubernetes expert. You just get it running somewhere, and then you use the Helm commands to install a chart against that cluster. And it's, it's like installing software. It just so happens that Helm allows you to install comp more complex software and install it in a repeatable way on, in a Kubernetes cluster. So I'd say go to the initial docs right away, right? And then, you know, if you just need something really quick, I'm sure there's tons of good YouTube videos. I do not have a good YouTube video for Helm. <laughs> um, but you could do that. That would be a, a, quick, a quick little entry. I think that Helm is one of those tools, at least in my toolkit, that I only learn new things about it when I need to learn them. So at first, it was all about just how to use it to install a chart for, you know, drone, to run a drone CI server or for Jenkins or I needed to install um, 
a database mirror of some sort, you know, a, a simple two server setup for Postgres or something. And I just learned and found a good chart that at least it looked like other people were using that chart on GitHub. And you can also use, um, you can, there are chart repos, uh, op, Helm operators, or what's, what's, is it operator hub? Operator hub.io, I think is one. You can also find operators, which are not quite Helm charts, but um, those things are correlated, are related, Helm and operators. And so I would just do it that way, because if you're just going to go through a course on it or a, um, a lot of stuff like that, you, you, it needs to be something you're interested in, <laughs> I think, in order to really retain the knowledge. Um, so yeah, do that. That's how I learned it. Um, Sai says, uh, I brought your Docker and 8, Docker 8's mastery courses and practiced a lot and I landed a job. Well, congrats. That's awesome. Come back with more details on port forwarding and things by next session. All right. All right. Um, Dev Kashan. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, DevOps engineer, and I experienced one year, wanted to know more about databases, how every database works, like when to use which database, and what are best practices, so how to proceed with this. That's a great question. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, obviously, I mean, I am old, so I learned databases back in the 90s. Uh, so, you know, I started with ones that I don't even use today, right? Like, back then, it was all Oracle, and then eventually, it was Microsoft SQL, and we had uh, like DB2 and mainframe, mini frame kind of things. And, and then Microsoft SQL showed up. And then eventually uh, MySQL showed up as an open source alternative. And then eventually Postgres showed up. So uh, I don't know. I, that's a great, I, I mean, that's, I'm sure there's a blog entry out there somewhere where someone is comparing and contrasting different database setup, setups. I, the short answer is there are a dizzying array of options out there and you're you should only really need to learn one at a time so you're probably wanting to start with an open source one maybe start with postgres and learn some of the basics of the postgres config file install something like a postgres gui on your machine and so post postico um, so you can get the Postgres server for free, right? You could also do MySQL, but I don't know. Nowadays, I've, I think, I feel like uh, Postgres has a little bit of an edge um, in the marketplace. I see it more often. Uh, it's more, it seems to be to be more common in open source development, at least with the people I, I see and the things I do. Then you can get this uh, client. Uh, it's actually, this one's only for Mac. So there might, there's probably one for Windows. This is the one I use on my Mac. Um, Postico. I don't know if that's how you say it. Postico. <laughs> uh, so you, go, you get the Postgres server in a container, right? Running in a container. Then you get the client and then you start learning how to administrate it. Some of the basics. You're going to learn, you need to learn about how to create users, how to create databases, some of that basic SQL stuff. So, there, so SQL is one major type of database solution. And it uses a language. I think it's T-SQL is the language, SQL. And that's a common language of commands like select, select statements. And you probably should learn that because even as a basic database administrator, understanding select, you know, SQL statements, learn SQL, uh, it's T-SQL. Um, yeah, so even the doc, Microsoft docs have basic tutorials on learning insert, inserts and selects. These are, the, these are the commands you use to put data in and get data out of a database. And a database, when you first start, is really just a bunch of Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> so now, SQL is one major type. The other major type is NoSQL. And that you will see is sort of the, it's, it's, it includes everything under the sun that doesn't adhere to this SQL type commands, right? Where you have these insert commands and select commands. And the most, one of the more popular ones of that is, um, is MongoDB. So I would, if I was learning databases or I was teaching someone databases, I would ask them to go learn the basics of how to administrate Postgres, 
and then learn some of the basic commands for putting data in and getting data out of Postgres, not using programming languages, just using basic SQL commands. And then I would probably have you go learn MongoDB because MongoDB is about as different from standard SQL as you can get. Um, there are many other options out there in the NoSQL space. There are also cloud-hosted versions and then versions you run yourself. The versions I'm having you ta I'm talking about here are ones you run in, you can run in containers on your own. You don't need a, a AWS specific thing. You don't need an Azure specific thing. Um, and so once you've learned those two and learned basic commands, how to create users, how to back up databases, how to restore those databases, how to put some basic data in, get data out, you're kind of like, you're already prepared for anything else you need to do. Um, after that, it re you really have to become a database expert, I feel like, because knowing when to use one database or another uh, really requires in-depth knowledge of each one of those types of databases and their pros and cons. Um, so I tend to find that people use the one they know. If, they, if you know Postgres, it's, you know, it's, what is it? When you only know how to swing a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So when you only know one type of database, you only know how to implement that database. So you do that with every project. So my advice is learn one like Postgres that's a SQL based, learn one like Mongo that's no SQL based. And those two, you will start, your brain will start to work about how they're different and where they're be one's better and the other one's worse. Um, and then probably after that, the next step is to learn how to make them redundant. Learn how to make them fail over because that's a really good skill for anyone in DevOps to have. And you want to learn how to make a, with SQL, with SQL, it's typically a SQL mirror. Uh, there's a mirror is one type of way to basically, t or to take a SQL database and make a complete copy of it. And it keeps, it's a one-way sync. Um, when you get to things like NoSQL, they will be usually set up in a replica cluster. And they will, you can have many copies and it's a little bit different of a setup idea and they're a little bit more flexible. There's also, you can start getting into all these other things like cockroach DBs that are native to containers and stuff like that. But this is where you should start. Like you could easily spend a few months just learning these two. I'd say they're very, very popular. And then you can start going down the rabbit hole of all the other variants. But as long as you learn these two, I think you'll be good to go. That's a really long answer. <laughs> all right. That's, that's a great question. Um, how, okay, so, uh, Kamaraju, I'm so, I'm always messing up your name. Apologies for that. Um, can we communicate two user defined networks to each other, like container one on one and user defined network and container two on another? Uh, if you're talking about Docker networks, I'm assuming that's what you're talking about. No. That's, that's not how you design Docker networks. If you need a container to talk to another container, they need to be on the same network. Even if they're the only two containers on that network, that's how they communicate. That's, it's a different design than traditional networking and firewalls, but Docker tried to make it super simple. So their design is, if two, if two of your containers need to talk, you need to create a network for those two to talk on it. Um, they can use one of your existing networks, but if you don't want them to have access to anything else on that network, then you need to create an additional network. So you can have a many, many relationship. You can have many containers in one Docker network, and you can have many networks attached to one container. And that's how it works. Um, all right. What is your expectation, uh, Prashant, on seven years of actual experience, C++ back in dev, and last three years in DevOps, what will be the expectation in this scenario? Um, I'm not sure. What do you mean your expectation? I'm not sure um, what INTW means. I don't know what that acronym is for. Oh, in, maybe in the wild. I'm not sure what INTW is. Um, maybe uh, ask me that question a different way, Prashant, and I will try to answer it. Uh, I'm not sure if you're talking about getting a job. You've, you've had a job in DevOps for three years, sounds like. But uh, I'm not sure what the question is. All right. 
Yeah, how to configure a DNS server for containers. Um, I'm not sure what you mean. Are you asking me how do you configure, like, are you how to, how to set up your own DNS server in a container? Like, I don't run DNS servers, so I'm not sure if you're asking about like Docker DNS or Kubernetes DNS. Uh, help me, help me with a better specific question. Um, how much DB knowledge is required for a DevOps engineer? It depends on your role. So the DevOps engineer is a generic title. It doesn't mean, it could mean one of a dozen type of jobs. Unfortunately, I would have to look at the job description to figure out if that job is expecting you to know databases. But um, if you're going to, so there's a spectrum. We actually talked about this last week. Uh, Nana from her Tech World with Nana channel was on the show. We spent all last week, if you go to YouTube, that little, vi that little link above, brett.live, go to last week's show. We talked all about DevOps engineers and the spectrum of jobs, right? So I consider there's a wide spectrum. On one end is ops. On the other end is um, developers, all right? So imagine you've got, let's see, ops over here, developers over here. A DevOps engineer job can be someone anywhere in that spectrum. They may be very ops focused over here, and they might care more about monitoring tools. So they need to know Prometheus and in enterprise logging tools, like maybe Splunk, or how to, how to collect logs and aggregate them and put them on dashboards and look at monitoring events and, and create alerts around monitoring events and notify you know, the on-call engineer. Like that could be DevOps. That could, you, could, you could have a DevOps engineer doing that work. Or you could have someone that's much more developer focused that's more about build engineering maybe. They're, they're focused on the CI platform and automating all of the CI jobs for testing. And they're maybe getting into a little bit of the continuous deployment and they're learning how to use uh, tools to automatically deploy containers, right? So there's all these different things. If you're in a very small team, it usually ends up falling on the shoulders of one or two people and they have to know everything which is really hard to do, right? That's, a, that's someone who has to know a lot of different things. So I'd say when you're starting in DevOps, you want to know a little bit about a lot of things. You want to learn one type of database. You want to learn one type of CI tool. You want to learn one cloud and how to deploy infrastructure in one cloud. You'll probably want to learn the basics of something like Terraform for how to create infrastructure, um, stuff like that, right? But what you don't want to do at your beginning with DevOps is to learn five or six of the same thing. Because once you've learned one tool, like once you've learned a CI tool, let's just say Jenkins, or my favorite currently, GitHub Actions. If you've learned one of those well, and you know how to test in it, and how to automatically create images in it, and take those images and put them up in your Docker registry, and then automatically deploy those with some sort of CI tool or CD tool to automatically deploy it to your servers, Maybe if you've watched this show for a while, you've heard me talk about GitOps and you're looking into things like Flux and Argo CD. So those are tools that will automatically take your, your containers and update your servers with them. So learn one of each of those tools, right? And then, so you've got one cloud, you've got one infrastructure creation tool like Terraform, you've got one CI tool, maybe a separate CD tool for continuous deployment, and then you've learned some basics of Docker and Kubernetes, we assume, because you're probably going to be deploying containers all the time. And you've learned the basics of all those things. And maybe you know a little bit about database administration of one type of database. You, you know some database backup commands and restore commands. You know how to make a database cluster like in, in your environment. Personally, I recommend you just use the cloud's databases. Don't, don't become an expert in making your own database clusters. The cloud's way better at it. So, so I wouldn't even expect a junior DevOps engineer to have experience designing and deploying enterprise scalable, um, automated, redundant database clusters. That's not something I expect someone to know how to do. We have the cloud for that now. If you're in a big enterprise data center, you probably have a full-time DBA that should know a lot about that. So I would not expect someone to be a guru. I would expect them to know how to back something up and to restore some data and some of the basics of SQL commands, but um, it, the, the role is going to totally depend the tool set, right? If you try to get hired in a job and they want Ansible, 
and you don't know Ansible at all, then that may be, you may not be able to get that job. It totally depends on the hiring manager. The hiring manager may look at you though and see how you have all these other skills. This happens to me a lot, is that when people find good people, they want them even though they might not have the exact skills they need today. Because in DevOps, it's not so much about what tools you know now, it's about how you learn and how you share. I don't care as a hiring manager whether you know the latest version of Terraform. What I do care is that you're always learning, that you have your own methods for learning, and you're, you, know, you have a home lab, you know, you're learning all the time, you're passionate about new technology, so you're staying up to date, or at least you're trying to. doesn't mean you're always completely up to date. It just means you're trying to. You're always learning something new. And, that, and more importantly, that you know how to share that knowledge. Because when, when you're building out a DevOps team, one of the foundational principles of DevOps is sharing your knowledge and working in a team collaboratively, collaboratively. <laughs> and so if you're someone who just sits and you know what you know, and you don't talk it to anyone about it, you don't share it, if you're not putting stuff into open source on the internet, if you're not involved in the open source community, if you're not making your own GitHub repos to share your ideas, if you're not blogging in some fashion, if you're not running lunch and learns to teach others in your job now, you should start doing that. And so, all these things over time, you will do some of them. But if you don't have a GitHub profile, you should work on getting a GitHub profile and starting to learn some things and create some things in open source. Because the teams that I find that are the best at DevOps and the people that I hire that are best in those teams, they, sure, they know some new stuff. They may not know everything new, and that's totally fine. But they're, they, know, they know how to learn. They're consistently learning. They're consistently sharing. And they don't, they, um, they value how much they teach others around them and how much they can share, right? So they write good documentation. They make great readmes in Markdown on GitHub, right? These are the attributes of a good engineer in my mind. And so the, the hiring managers that I work with and the teams that I work with, they care more about that you have a pattern and a history of learning new things, trying new things, and then teaching other new things. And that's more important than whether or not you know the latest version of Kubernetes or the latest version of Docker or whatever, All right? So take that to heart because that, that if, if that's something you need to work on, put aside the learning of you know, the latest, you know, some other tool that you already know, a comparable tool. Like if you know Azure, that's good enough. You may not need to know everything about AWS yet, but you do need to get some of your knowledge out there so that you have a presence on the internet and that you can show off your portfolio to, to pr prospective managers that you're, are trying to hire you. All right. Um, anyway, that's my soapbox. Uh, Julian says, I want to change from bind mounts to volumes in production. Most of my sites are CMS, so site can change files in a volume. Is there a good pattern to upload or sync my dev file changes to the volume? Um, no, I do not know of anything like that. I have a simple tool called Vacup, V-A-C-K-U-P. Yep, V-A-C-K-U-P. So I have a very simple tool here that allows you it's not really meant to sync the way you're talking about, but it is a way, if you have volumes, to um, get stuff into volumes or get stuff out of volumes. It may work for you. It may not. I will post this in chat. Um, it's not super well tested. I think there might be a bug or two in it, but uh, it is something that I created as an idea, and a few people have checked it out. So that, but uh, in, in reality, volumes are just, other paths on the, on the hard drive, right? There's nothing inherently special about them. So syncing of volumes or migrating data, you know, you know, how, you know, you have the Docker copy command, right? You can do a Docker copy and copy stuff in and out of containers that includes copying it in and out of a volume. So if you just looked at this tool, all it is is a shell script. You can see that in a lot of these, what I'm doing is I'm doing Docker copy commands to get stuff out. And I, um, well, actually, 
Let's see what I do with do Docker copy. I may do it a different way. Yeah, actually, I do it a little bit fancier in this script. What I'm doing is running commands inside containers. But if you simply needed to copy a file from inside a container or a container volume that's in a running container, you just need to copy it out. Just look up Docker copy. Um, that's a built-in feature of Docker. So that'll get you to, you can get files in and out. Hopefully that helps. When I do port forwarding to connect Postgres in a local machine, it's working, but not working in a VPN. Yeah, so that's going to just be, um, yeah, that's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of moving parts with that. I'm not sure I can really help with that. But you know, over the VPN, um, you're going to want to make sure you have the connectivity for the port forwarding to work, right? And one of the requirements of the port forwarding is that you're able to talk to the Kubernetes API endpoint, um, because that's kind of how it's using this, is through that endpoint. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit more complex of a scenario than I think I'm able to help on the live show. But good luck. Sorry about that. Uh, should it be accessing files directly in the volume using something like SSH service in another container, which gives access to the same volume? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, would, I don't ever put SSH in containers. I mean, the whole reason you have Docker commands and kube control commands is so that you don't need SSH to get into containers. So you have the exact commands. You can get in there. You, can, you have the Docker copy command like I just talked about. Um, if you need to get stuff out of volumes in Kubernetes, you're... Um, I'm not sure what the best way to do that is off the top of my head. Maybe someone in chat knows. Um, how to Dockerize IoT device registration. Uh, sorry, I have no idea. <laughs> Never done it. Um, sorry, Arun. Uh, service meshes, any thoughts? Uh, yes, if you don't need it, don't do it. Service meshes are an additional optional component. And if you don't have a bunch of the problems, and if you don't have problems then you, like, the question is, is what are you doing to, you know, what, what problems do you have that you think service meshes will solve? And then once, you, once you've learned a little bit about what service meshes are doing, um, I don't have an opinion on which one you should use. There are, you know, there's Istio, like you said, console. Um, there is a really simple one. Uh, these are all getting easier and simpler to use, but they're historically very complex and very burdensome on your infrastructure. In fact, there's been several people in this chat that have talked about how uh, their service mesh actually used more resources than their app did. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense in that case if you're burning all your time managing your infrastructure. Um, but there's a, a, a simple one called Mesh. I, I, that's how I pronounce it. Uh, it's by Traffic. So if you go look up Traffic Mesh, uh, they have a very simple one. Uh, Istio is getting a little bit simpler in that way, in that regard. But I would go after the simplest one possible and not try to get so complex and full, you know, when you have proxies everywhere and you have lots of layers of complexity and, you know, everything's mutually authenticated and encrypted and that's all great, but you have to, you have to really learn a lot of those things. So I tend to discourage new people from using Service Mesh until they're really good at Kubernetes and Docker and they've got their monitoring down and they know how to do basic troubleshooting and they kind of understand how service meshes will solve problems that are becoming more apparent, especially when you start doing microservices. And, you know, I wouldn't use a service mesh if you have 10 containers or 20 containers. I would wait until you have a lot of complexity and you need a higher level tool like that because it's just more to run. It's more things that can break. It's more things you got to maintain. So, um... Let's see. Uh, Docker DNS. So you, if you need, if you if you're talking about Docker run commands, uh, Docker run commands allow you to add names. So just look up on the Docker command dash Docker run dash s help. You will see ways to add DNS names in there, so you can make any names you want for containers. That's what you're talking about. You don't really have a direct access to change. You know, like a, there's no like central centralized backend DNS server that you can configure necessarily. Um, the DNS is specific per container and per Docker network. So it's all about the names that you give that container when you start the run command. That's how you kind of customize it. Uh, how do I inject environment variables to match different environments at image build without using multiple Docker files? Um, 
over to you. I'm going to say that. Hopefully, I didn't mispronounce that too bad. Over to you. Uh, the w so first off, you want to set up defaults in the Docker file for anything that's environment based. I should be able to run the same image. You build one image, and that one image should be able to run locally on my machine. So in Dev, it should be able to run in a test server, and it should that same image should be able to run in production. And the only things that I've changed are when I use a Docker run command or a compose file or a Kubernetes manifest file or Helm chart, any of those things, all of them, they all standardize on using environment variables. So you can inject those different environment variables, like maybe it's node ENV equals production or you know Rails ENV equals dev or whatever, all those different ones, right? Your database username, your database password. All those things are environment variables. And that comes from the concepts of 12 factor, which I'm still a big fan of, even though they're a decade, more than a decade old at this point. Um, if you haven't heard about the 12 factor, go look up 12 factor on the internet, 12factor.net. I'll put this in chat and read about config and environment, because that's where you want to change your mindset around you'd never want to make an image that is environment specific. So you wouldn't you would never have multiple Docker files that have anything to do with hard coding in environment settings. Um, those are you can you put them in Docker files, but those are the temporary defaults. So, you know, your mileage may vary there, right? Like like mine, I tend to write all my defaults in my Docker file for production but I would never store passwords in there, right? I would always leave those either blank or some dummy password. <clears throat> and then I always overwrite those with my Docker run commands or my compose files or my Kubernetes manifest or whatever. And you're, you're following the config concepts of 12 factor there, you're, which mandates that your code, you have strict separation of your code, which is the image, that's the artifact that your image builds. And then the environment configuration, which is done at runtime. So when you think about Docker, Docker, Docker files and Docker images are all about build time. And then when you set environment, you're setting that at runtime. That's why when you look at things like Kubernetes and Swarm, they have things called configs or config maps and secrets because those things are runtime concerns about your environment. And they're gonna change for every environment, right? Staging will be different, test will be different, production will be different. But those are all, all those environment variables and, and config files in some cases that it's injecting into your container when it first starts. Your app needs to be looking at those environment variables every time it starts and pulling its config from those. Does that make sense? All right, hopefully that helps. Um, Ahmad says, I'll be starting a role as a DevOps engineer in a bank soon as a fresh grad, but my interest is more in the software dev, would it be wise to stay in DevOps or switch to development in a few years? Well, I mean, this is, it's hard to answer that question because it's about what you want, right? Like, I can't tell you what you should, what you should do because that's really what your, where does your passion lie? Where do your interests lie? So I would say if you've got the DevOps job and you are learning to be a software developer, then try to get closer to the software developers in your DevOps job, right? Because there are some DevOps jobs where you're, you're working day in, day out with the developers. You are helping them with their Docker files. You're helping them build their Kubernetes manifest. You're helping them with their CI and how to properly test. And you're learning about package management tools like NPM and Apt and Gems, you know, and Maven and all these different things that you use in different coding languages to install dependencies, right? So you can work day in and day out with developers and, and maybe on your own, you're learning to code and learning to develop on your free time. But in your day job, you're working day in and day out with developers. And the cool thing there is that you'll learn the lingo. You'll learn all the ways that they do things, um, good and bad, right? Um, so that when you want to then eventually go for that developer job, there are lots of development jobs, by the way, that are you're you're writing code but you're technically still in the devops space and so that code may be about writing better health checks into the application for better monitoring right 
um, improving the logging syntax and the and the logging inside of applications. Re- you know, there there is a job we call them SREs a lot of time. Uh, SREs, just go look that up. Google SRE, and that job. One of the big roles of that job is to improve the resiliency of applications that other people may have built. So you might be a member of a team and maybe they're running in PHP or in Java or something, and they're developing the features that the users care about. And then you, maybe more in the DevOps or SRE space, you're a developer too, but you're writing the code that, or you're helping the other developers write their code better so that it's more secure, it's more resilient, meaning that if it fails, it fails better, meaning that it gives better error codes, right? It gives better descriptions of what the problem was. And maybe you're writing health check codes to improve the ability for it to be monitored because not every developer that's writing a feature is good, unfortunately. They're not great at writing good tests for those that work in not just unit tests, but also functional tests. And that things are tested from outside the application or monitored from outside the application. So there's a whole world there that you could explore while you're in DevOps and you have that job and you're making good money in the the DevOps job. And eventually then, if you want to go full-time developer, I've watched people in the same company move from full-time developer over to DevOps roles and back and forth. Okay, so that's, that's a real thing. They don't have to leave the company because once you're considered a good employee and the management sees you as the good engineer, they're going to want to keep you. So if you say to them, hey, I'm getting a little bored with this DevOps thing. I'd like to go build some of those cool features and be a full-time feature developer. They may say, great, we, have, we need that. We have more need over there. We'll, we'll just transfer you to that job. It happens all the time, okay? So I don't see that as a mutually exclusive, you have to change careers kind of thing. Uh, to me, they're all part of the same career. Many, many people start out developer, go into DevOps, go back to full-time developer, and vice versa. All right? Great question, though. Uh, what certificates would you recommend for your DevOps career? I have two years experience. Well, um, I would probably start, if you're just going for uh, a sort of middle of the road, meaning you're not too focused on development, you're not too focused on operations, because I, again, am more on the operations side, so I'm going to get more operations type certificates. Like I might get a Kubernetes certificate. Um, I might get a Linux sysadmin certificate um, so that I can sort of prove to a job that I know a little bit about how to run a Linux machine because that is important nowadays. Um, Even if you're a Windows administrator, I would suggest you still get a Linux, uh, some sort of Linux training or Linux certificate. Uh, And then, so I would go, if you're middle of the road, I would probably do cloud certificates first. And if you don't have a preference, if you're if you're focusing on a specific job, like maybe in your current company, and you want to get promoted, or you want a different job in your company, look at what your company's using and get certificates in that. If you don't have a job like that, and you're just looking out there for any job available, then I would say focus on an AWS certificate or two. They have generic ones. I mean, they have base the beginner ones. And then they deviate and they have specific DevOps certificates in AWS. So you could look at getting those. And then when you start looking for jobs, you probably want to focus on the jobs that are on AWS, right? You probably don't want to go after the job that's, that requires that you know a ton about Azure if you're focusing on AWS. Because when you're starting out, again, don't try to learn all the clouds all at once. Just learn one a little bit. Um, AWS has 186 services, I think now. I only know about a dozen or so well enough to feel like I could teach someone. (laughs) Um, There are so many that I don't use and no team that I've worked with use. So just because there's 183 things that AWS provides doesn't mean you have to even learn a, a, a a, a fraction of those. Um, you want to learn the basics of security, the basics of servers, the basics of databases, and then object storage. So, um, security, how to deploy, how to create VM servers, right? How to create networks, how to create storage. So server storage, as well as object storage, like S3 and then databases. So how, how do they run databases? How do you create those? 
How do you get your servers to talk to the databases? Uh, and then things like a little bit more networking, load balancers, right? Firewalls, that sort of thing. Proxies, caches, all that. So once you've learned that, that uh, is like the, that's the core stuff. Because there's all these other things. There's machine learning. There's um, serverless. There's all these other stuff, that, things that you can learn. There's AI, blah, blah, blah. There's voice stuff. There's SMS. There's just a ton. But you don't have to learn that for most jobs. Most jobs will only use a few of those. And they will probably not be hiring requirements. They'll, you know, they'll just want you to know the basics. So, um, I am Azure DevOps certified. Is required Kubernetes deep knowledge? Um, no, you, I, I'm not, I think that the question is, do you have to know Kubernetes well? Um, not necessarily. I think it just depends on what you want to be. Are you wanting to run Kubernetes clusters and be a full-time Kubernetes admin? Then yes. If you're just a developer that wants to deploy your apps on Kubernetes in the cloud, then no, you don't, you don't really have to learn that much. You just need to learn the basics like I teach in my course. And then there's probably someone else that's going to run and manage the Kubernetes clusters. So I don't think so. Um, yeah, interview, interview questions. <laughs> Please do a dedicated live show on Terraform. Um, so yeah, I, I think it would be good to bring someone in, especially from the Terraform team, maybe one of the project managers, and to focus on what I would call like the modern container-focused Terraform solutions, because Terraform can do lots of things. But I, do, I don't use it for lots of things. I use it to get, like, for example, I don't use Terraform to deploy my applications. That's what I use GitOps for. I don't use Terraform to do CI deployments or anything like that. I I use it to build infrastructure, and and now anymore, <laughs> uh, there's new cool things like crossplane that might eventually replace a lot or all of what Terraform is needed for in the modern computing things like crossplane. But crossplane is pretty new, so we're gonna have to wait and see um, how that all fleshes out. Um, building a Docker image that needs to store the config files on a bind mount. Copy config files on first run to the bind mount, same location. What is the creation startup process? Um, so it sounds like you need entry point scripts. I'm, I'm already a little skeptical on you needing config files and bind mounts. That sounds um, a little bit, it sounds a little bit like an anti-pattern to me, but if, uh, in other words, you probably want to use something like Swarm or Kubernetes or something that will manage your configuration for you in a database and store it there rather than storing them on the host. But you probably you may have some good reasons. So I'm not saying that it's, there's no reason to do that. But you need an entry point script. So go look up something like Postgres on Docker Hub. You go to, go just to Docker Hub, right? And I just go and I look up the Postgres image. And so this is the art of entry point scripts. So in case you didn't know, there are two things in the Docker file, entry point and CMD. Those two commands at runtime are technically just mashed together as one long command. It's entry point, and then it adds the CMD onto the very end of it. And what that ends up doing is if I just go look at the Docker file, and this is a SQL, a Postgres SQL Docker file, right? If I go all the way down to the bottom, you will see eventually it copies in an entry point script and then it makes the it makes the entry point run that script and then down at the bottom the command runs the final server right now this entry point and the cmd are not executed until you start the container but the magic of that entry point script is that it is a shell script in this case i believe it's probably bash so I can go look at this shell script right inside here, inside the repo, right off of Docker Hub. And this shell script will do all sorts of things. It brings in environment variables and sets them up for Postgres to use them. If you're using file-based secrets, it will actually go find those files and then turn those into environment variables for you so that Postgres can pick them up. It does all that right here. And, what, and so this, and this thing will do, go and it creates the first database. It actually creates the default admin user. It sets the password. It does all these things. And it does that on the first startup of the container. So it's a relatively complex script because it's smart enough on every start 
to go and check if these things have already been done. And if the database already exists and the password's already set, then it's not going to overwrite it, right? It's not going to mess with it. But down at the very bottom is the magic line. That magic line is this exec line. And what that does in a script is that says, pass the execution to the next thing on the command line that was run. So remember, entry point is, and, and the CMD are combined. They're just added in one long string and Docker will just start a container with that one long string. So the way that this container is gonna look like to Linux is that you, you ran entry point, the, the Docker entry point shell script, right? Docker dash entry point dot shell, cause that's what it was set, set at. And then after that will be the word Postgres D or like the, the Postgres daemon for the Postgres server. And so this little command at the end of your, your shell script will basically say, okay, pass execution away from this shell script to whatever is on the rest of my line, which happens to be what's in CMD. So that's how that shell script on every startup is smart enough to do a bunch of things, and then it will pass execution to whatever's next in the command, which is what you put here, all right? So in your app, if you need to do things like copy a bunch of config files over to a certain directory from some other directory, you would put all that in a script, put it all in an entry point, and then store that entry point in your image. All right, so that entry point script stays with your, your, your code, in your code repo. It, it goes into your, your image at build time so that when the container is started, it always starts up and preps that whole configuration mess. All right, hopefully that helps. Um, all right, how to understand Docker and Docker user IP tables. I went through Docker docs, but I am still trying to find out insights to understand more like the internals. Um, well, the assumption there is that you are well-versed in IP tables because Docker isn't doing anything special in IP tables. It's just writing rules, additional rules into your existing IP table setup. So. Um, and I am not an IP tables expert. I can read them, but I don't typically, I don't typically type from memory, you know, IP tables commands. Um, I have friends and I have the internet for that. So what I would say is it probably would behoove you to go learn more about IP tables. And as you learn how IP tables works by default, then that maybe will make the Docker stuff make more sense because the Docker, the Docker lines, again, are just standard. It's creating segments and adding rules to them um, that are just sort of generic IP table rules. Because, you know, in the background, Docker is making fake, IP, you know, fake interfaces. We call them VES, um, making fake interfaces and then adding, uh, you know, private IP addresses and then making a firewall rules, basically, and forwarding rules to make sure that the packets go where they need to go on the Docker networks and making sure that traffic coming in on your publish port goes to the correct network and the correct container. So it's, it's managing all those every time you type in Docker network commands or Docker run commands. It, you know, every time you type one of those, it's editing those rules, all right? So I don't know if that helps, but um, hopefully that'll get you farther. Does VACUP work on Ubuntu with Snap? Snap volumes, no, Sly. Uh, VACUP is all about Docker volumes. That's all it does, which is um, why it's Docker. It's Docker VACUP is Docker volume backup. That's kind of the short name for it. So uh, that's, that's all it is. Hello. Love from India, appreciate it. Hello, Prakar. Prakar, sorry if I mispronounced that, I'm trying. Um, uh, okay, so Prashant's ba uh, back to answering the, the uh, maybe the clearing up the question a little bit. Sorry on the confusion there. Uh, if I show seven years as dev and three years in DevOps, what would be the level expectation in interview? Um, I mean, if you've got seven years as a developer and three years in DevOps, then as far as I'm concerned, you can probably handle any DevOps job. So I'm not, so, you know, I would expect you, uh, if you say you have seven years as a developer and then three as DevOps, I'm going to dig into what you did as in those DevOps roles, because again, there's lots of different things in DevOps. So you may have been someone in DevOps who was only working on continuous integration and testing. 
You may have never dealt with setting up monitoring and events and alerting and lo- centralized logging and all those kinds of things, right? Which those are more ops specific, but some DevOps people do those things. So I would be interviewing you and asking you about your experience and making sure that the type of DevOps person that I need, because you know there's lots of different developers, right? Just saying you're a developer doesn't mean that you're good for my project. I might be working in Java and you only know Ruby. So it's the same thing in DevOps. You may say, I, I've been doing DevOps, um, but I've mostly been focused on serverless and lambdas and automating those. And I'm writing in Node.js to write automation for that kind of thing. And then I, I, what I need in my DevOps person is someone who knows Ansible and Terraform and how to build out infrastructure. And maybe you don't have that experience. So it just depends. It depends on the job and what kind of experiences they need in that job. Um, if they're, in my opinion, if they're a good hiring manager, they will care more about how you learn and how fast you learn and how you teach others. Because I can always tell you to go learn Terraform in a week, right? Go, go focus on Terraform your first week on the job, learn the basics, show me how you build, you know, show me some examples of how you build out your infrastructure. And then I can probably have you doing sort of a junior um, Terraform job, right? But I do that for, I'm doing that for someone who's, you know, going to be a junior Terraform person, but I, I care more about how you learn, not how much you uh, know. So yeah, hopefully that helps. That's just me though. Some people, they want someone that can start today doing Kubernetes administration and they're hiring a Kubernetes admin. And the title of the, en- the engineer job title might be DevOps Kubernetes something. But really what they're wanting is an administrator for Kubernetes, right? Um, let's see, let's go back over. I don't know why my screen looks so weird today. Did that just happen? It's weird. Um, all right. Brett, how to define limits on pods in Kubernetes for new application? Do we need to use trial and error practice there or some best practices approach for defining limits per pod? Okay, so I'm assuming you know how to in in the YAML, right? Because you just go look at the documentation on the YAML. Um, I'm I'm distracted here by, that one works, that one works. Why is that one so funky all of a sudden? I'm distracted by my windows. I don't know what happened to them today. They got weird. All right, not gonna worry about it. Doesn't matter. Um, So the question is about best practices for uh, limits and pods. All right, so you have to learn your apps, essentially. You You have to measure and monitor each app running in a real world scenario and see its real usage. And then you set limits based on that real usage. So for example, if I've got a SQL server, a SQL server is going to try to use all the RAM you give it. It's just going to eat, it's going to eat up all the RAM in a server. That's, desi- that's what it's designed to do. So you're going to have to learn like what, how much RAM your, server, your database server needs in order to make your application perform well. The more indexes you have in a database server, the more RAM it's going to use. You know, this, this really gets into each application specific. There are no best practices as, as, as far as I'm concerned, other than you need to monitor your applications as they are today and see what their real usage is. So I can typically go to so, some team and let's say, let's say they have a Node.js app or they have a PHP app. They've probably got that running on servers in production. I'm gonna go look at the real usage of their CPU and their memory in their monitoring solution today. And I'm gonna watch the behavior over time. What is it, where does it spike? Where does it, you know, where does it use, what does it use when it first starts up? Where does it use after 24 hours? How much does it use under heavy load? And I am then going to set limits for that in Kubernetes, okay? Only after I understand how the app works can I set those limits. I'm also going to set those limits a little high because you never want to accidentally start crashing your apps under their normal behavior. You never really want to set them to crash under normal behavior when you've maybe set the limits too too tight, okay? So you want to set those reservations up 
which are just as important, to make sure that it puts your app on a server where it has enough room in terms of CPU and memory. It has enough room to run. So that's what the reservations are gonna do for you. And again, that's looking at the real world usage of your app. If, you're, if you've got a brand new app and you don't have it in production yet, then you're gonna have to learn how to benchmark that app. And you're gonna learn benchmarking tools for whatever you're using. Every type of app has different benchmarking tools. Um, another a popular one for web apps is called Apache Bench. If you just look up Apache Bench, it's a very generic tool. AB, um, Apache Bench. That is one of many common tools that you can use to throw a whole bunch of HTTP connections with payload, meaning with actual data, at your server to see how your apps perform. How much memory does it use? How many CPUs does it consume? And when you do that, you start to understand the behavior of that app. You, as an operations person or as more of a DevOps operations focused person, you should learn how to do that someday. If you're a developer and your job as a developer in your team is to set those limits and reservations, then you have to learn how to do this too. You have to learn how to benchmark your app. There are also um, lots of other tools. You can even get tools on the internet, cloud tools that will send a bunch of traffic to your app if it's on the internet, if it's a web app. And then you can monitor your app and watch all of the things happen, okay? Then once you do that, then you start to set reservations. I set them very conservative. So I set them really high. And then over time, as I understand my app more and more and I get used to it, I will maybe tighten those down a little bit so that they're a little bit closer to the real world. But at first, if you set them really, if you, if you set them too, too conservative, if you are set too aggressive, I guess I would say, you can kill your app accidentally. You can have an out of memory error and then kill your app even when it's norm, running normal and healthy. And you don't want to do that. So I hope that helps. It's a great, great question. Great question. All right. Uh, DevSecOps Beginner's Guide. Hmm, I don't have one. Sorry, I don't have one for that. That's a good, that's a good question, but I don't have um, a good DevSecOps guide. I'm assuming when you say DevSecOps, you're focusing on the sec, right? Because DevOps, just learn DevOps, right? But sec usually implies the intersection of security. So then I would first, honestly, day one, I would go learn about CVEs, C-V-E, Common Vulnerability um, Exposures. Is it Common Vulnerability? Common vulnerability, vulnerabilities and exposures, CVEs. So you go to uh, the CVE database and you learn about what CVEs are. There's some great channels on that. You can find some great videos on that on YouTube. And you learn about what vulnerabilities are, how they're reported. Then go learn about c container image scanning. So you might look up Trivi, right? So you might look up a tool called Trivi, T-R-I-V-Y. This tool will scan an image and tell you all the CVEs in it. Then you might go learn about code scanning tools that actually look in your code for common patterns and potential vulnerabilities. That's something else that security people care about. And the whole point in you learning all this is that the reason we have DevSecOps is because DevSecOps is trying to do what we call shift left security. And what that means is if, um, let's see, this is my left, okay? So uh, over on the left are my developers and over on my right are operations and security people. And, and the biggest problem we've had with security over the last 20 years, one of the biggest problems is that we wait until application developers get all the way to right before we go production. And then that's when security does their scans and, they, and, they, and then they're like, oh, you have all these vulnerabilities and you have problems in your code that are insecure and you're leaking you're leaking abstractions, or you have HTTP endpoints that are open to exposure for SQL injection and all these common things, right? And then it holds up the project, and that's bad because now you were ready to go, you were ready to launch. And then the security team says, nope, it's not secure, not, not, not up to our standards. Well, the shift left means we're taking those security practices and we're using modern practices and tools to move that stuff closer to the developer so that the developer can work closer with security while they're writing code to make sure that things are better and more secure when they start. How do we do that? Well, we do this image scanning, 
We that's one of the things we do. On on when you have CI in the world of Docker, your CI tools should build images and then scan them. And so now you're getting every time you push a commit, you push a commit up to Git, it scans it. CI automatically runs, scans your image every single time. And so you can now see, you know, is my from image full of holes, full of problems? Is my code dependencies outdated and insecure? We now have on GitHub, by the way, all these automatic scanners, right? So if you go into one of your repos, you can now go and turn on all these security features. I recommend you do because these things are scanning your code, your, your Docker images, and eventually they're going to do things like scan your Kubernetes manifests. And there are plugins that you can get here from other companies such as Sneak, right? Sneak is one of many, but uh, there's Sneak, there's, um, I think Anchor is another one, um, Aqua Security is another one. All these security companies are giving you tools so that the developer can be aware much earlier in the development cycle of all the of potential problems. One of the neat things that I've liked lately is, I think it's Sneak. It, um, Sneak created a VS Code extension. I think it's Sneak. Let's look it up. Yeah. Um, security scanner for VS Code. So this is a, if you use VS Code, I'm a huge fan of Visual Studio Code as a developer tool and as a DevOps tool. I think it's a great editor for all your DevOps stuff. It knows how to read Kubernetes, Docker files, Kubernetes manifest, Helm charts, Terraform. It can do all those things. So this free tool from Sneak will let you in your code, see the vulnerabilities of all your dependencies inside of your package management tool. So if you're using NPM, it will show you in your package JSON file how many vulnerabilities there are for each dependency. It's a free tool it, and it works out of the box. That is DevSecOps shift left security. That's what we're talking about, getting more of these tools earlier in the process so that once you get ready to release, you, you, you've either accepted or eliminated any of the CVEs that you have in your code or in your code's dependencies, right? Um, yeah, so that's to me DevSecOps. I hope that helps. That was a long, long answer. Um, uh, databases in Docker, good, or databases as a service. You can totally run databases in Docker, but I always, always recommend using the cloud databases if you can. It's way easier, it's way better. They do databases way better than the rest of us do. They make them redundant, fault tolerant, automatically failover. They make backups. They do easy restores. You can make snapshots. You can create new clusters with a few clicks or a few Terraform commands. Like that's cloud databases. Doing it on your own, you have to become an expert in that database. How do you make it redundant? How do you properly monitor it? How do you know when it goes down or fails over? What happens? Are you testing all the time to make sure that if that node goes down, the database automatically shifts over and all your apps automatically use that new database server. Like there's a ton of complexity there to running your own databases. So I always advise doing the cloud if you can. Um, Kubernetes penetration testing, environment creation on local machine guide. Um, I don't have a guide for that. There are, um, I do believe there are um, actual, if you just like work up, look up workshops, Kubernetes penetration workshops, something like that. I think with KubeCon or something around KubeCon, some people did that. So maybe Google um, that. I, they may be on your local machine. I'm not sure if they're cloud-based, but I think I saw some stuff like that uh, around KubeCon last year. Um, uh, Ivan says, uh, I wonder on AWS about developer tools like Code Pipeline, Code Deploy. I would not bother with those tools until you have learned the industry standards, right? So learn GitHub really well. Learn Docker Hub, learn basics, create an account, upload some images, right? So, so no, no GitHub, no Docker Hub. Um, I, and I, I like everything GitHub does, almost everything. I don't like their wikis, but I like the GitHub actions. I, I, they're, I think they're really easy to use. They're, they're fast. If you're going to pay for GitHub, which most company employees get paid GitHub, you know, you're going to have free GitHub actions that you can use a certain number of minutes. And so I would 
those are to me much more feature rich and easier to use than any of the DevOps, DevOps tools in AWS. That's just me. It's very rare for me to get working on a project with the company and for them to use code pipeline, code deploy, and so on. Um, they use, they're probably going to use Jenkins or they might use, you know, another tool like drone to, to automate, or they might use, uh, um, code fresh or Travis CI or code, um, code ship. I mean, there's just so many out there, right? But most of them, very few of them that I have, that I work with most, you know, they, very few of them use code pipeline, code deploy. Um, that, that really is reserved for the team that uses AWS everything almost to a detriment, right? Because they use it, they use all the things that aren't great just because it's AWS. So um, I'm, I find more people using other tools. My, my preference, if you ask me, like if I built out a new team, um, a new team, I would be using everything in GitHub as, that I could. I'd be using code spaces and GitHub, uh, GitHub Actions and all the security tools in GitHub. And I would be automatically building my images in GitHub. I'd be using GitHub packages to store my NPM modules, my Ruby gems. I would use GitHub container registry probably to store my images. Uh, I would just put everything there for a private team on, you know, not doing open source, just private work um, because that's like a one-stop shop. You know, it's all there. Um, the AWS tools, not near as friendly. And the reality, here's the funny thing. If you're using all those tools in AWS, you're still probably going to be on GitHub every day because all the tools that you're using probably have dependencies and other open source stuff that you need to use. All those things are probably going to be on GitHub. So you're going to have like one tab or two tabs or 10 tabs on GitHub, and then you've got another tab on AWS stuff. So you, it's not like you can get rid of GitHub at this point. It's just, it's there, it's everywhere. So um, my, my experience is, yeah. I wouldn't bother with those tools. It might be nice eventually for you to learn them, but I would never learn them before I learn things like Jenkins or um, Circle CI or GitHub Actions, stuff like that. Anyway. All right. Uh, do you see different streams and do you see different streams in DevOps, one focusing on infra automation provisioning and other focusing on CI, CD? Honestly, every DevOps job I've seen is completely different. <laughs> every team labels jobs as DevOps for different things. It's a messy, messy world. It's just like being a developer, right? If you're a developer, it, who, who knows what, you know, we have all these terms like front-end developer, back-end developer, full-stack developer, you know, who knows what you might be doing? Right, front end developer. There's all different frameworks, different languages. Um, you know, so the same thing is true of DevOps. A DevOps job could be one of a dozen things at least, and you might be using completely different tools than some other DevOps person in a different company is using, and that's totally fine. So um, I would say it depends on where you come from. If you come from development, then focus on being a dev oriented DevOps person. You're going to focus on things like continuous integration and you know, deploying new types of monitoring in code in your app, improving the monitoring, improving the logging, helping the teams get better metrics out of their code so that they have better, better uh, monitoring for their app, right? You're going to focus on that end. If you're like me and you came from sysadmin and operations, you probably, are, your strengths lie in understanding networking and sysadmin and Linux servers and kernels and how firewalls work and how to set up and maintain monitoring solutions, right? And so you're going to be more on that side of DevOps. Um, so it just really depends on what, what, what you both like, your passion, and then what your experience and background is. I, I don't think there's a wrong answer there. Um, <laughs> Dave just says he raided the Twitch stream while not knowing the mainstream was on YouTube. It's not, there is no mainstream. It's just, everyone's everywhere. You know, hang out where you want. Um, but yeah, I'm using Restream, so I, I put it on all three. I also put it on Twitter with Periscope, so. Um, yeah, so yeah, see, here's a great example. One hundred, one hundreds of evicted pods when um, the limits are too slim. So yeah, 
yeah, you can have some real pro problems there if you're you're conservative. Do we have a way to connect pods with an existing Windows Active Directory setup? If the application uses Active Directory as authentication, um, GSMA is one way, but it's constrained. But is it constra constrained? I don't really know. I, I have not used Kubernetes with Active Directory, but you know, Active Directory is going to be outside of your cluster, and all your pods have routing to get outside the cluster. So if your pods just need to authenticate with an Active Directory endpoint, then they can just they can just go there, right? It's just a it's just going to be a DNS address and a port that the pod needs to reach, and your DNS. If you're a, an Active Directory environment, then you're probably going to be using Microsoft DNS servers, right? Because that's a feature of Windows, and so your pods are just going to need to make sure that their DNS eventually finds its way to your Active Directory upstream DNS servers. And then it's just going to find your DNS authentication through the, the standard DNS tooling and away you go. So I don't see anything unique um, unless you're talking more about Kubernetes RBAC and like how Kubernetes authenticates for admin permissions, which is a totally different thing, right? Which doesn't, to me, doesn't have anything to do with your pods accessing Active Directory. Um, it's more about your, about your RBAC model and, and how, it, how that works which I, I'm, I'm sure there's documentation out there on it, but I've never done it. So I don't have a lot of advice for that. Are there less tools to learn as someone that is looking to get into DevOps for a serverless architecture than a non-serverless environment? Um, I'm not sure that there's less, just different. I mean, serverless, you probably have to learn multiple serverless platforms and they're all different. So you probably have to learn Lambda and you might want to learn something like you know, open FAS. That's a, another alternative that is not um, specific to a cloud. So you're probably going to want to learn a cloud version and then some version that runs on Kubernetes or a couple like Knative, you know, a couple learn. And those are all run differently. Um, there's a lot of different definitions for what even serverless means and which things are serverless. Uh, so it, you know, it just depends. Some serverless uses containers as the deployment object. So you really just build images and then you tell the serverless platform to run them. I love that way. I think it's very consistent because I don't want to have a separate process for building my serverless stuff as I do for my non-serverless. I'd rather have a very consistent build and testing and deployment mechanism. That's just, my, that's just me. Uh, I'm looking for simplicity and reduced complexity. So I'm always trying to reduce the variables. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know that uh, the reality is, is that if you get into serverless, it's very hard to be only serverless, right? There's not that many jobs out there yet that only deal with serverless because even serverless needs databases and even serverless needs resources elsewhere that may not be serverless at the time, right? Um, so it's very few companies or very few jobs where the only thing you ever have to care about is a, a function right? A function as a service. So to me, serverless is just another tool in a developer's tool bag. And a, and a DevOps person might do automation with serverless or might have to help set up the serverless infrastructure. But I don't see serverless, like I've, not, I've never seen a job for a serverless DevOps engineer. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't, that might exist, I just have not seen it. So I, I don't know that, that, if that's a thing. Um, uh, any alternative to DevOps? Not really. DevOps is just a mindset and a process thing. And, it's, and you never stop DevOps, right? Like your team, there's always more efficiency in your team. You can always monitor better, recover from failure better. You can always test more. You can always build faster. You can always have less steps and less complexity and more automation in your processes, right? There's, there's never enough. You can always go faster. And DevOps is about reproducible results and going faster. The time, by the time I hit commit on some new code features in my app, the time from that to it running in production after it's been built and tested and tested well and tested again and you know, run in staging or wherever you need it to do, whatever you need to do there. Like that, that time from me hitting commit on a PR that's been approved and gone into the main branch or whatever you have 
from there to when it's running for my customers, that lead time is a metric. And that metric can always be shorter. It can always be better. So you never really stop DevOps. That's my, my, that's my, my, my theory on it. Um, what would be DevOps? Hello. Hi. What's up, DD? Um, wh what would be DevOps entry-level job requirements look like? Trying to switch from ops role to DevOps. Got experienced three plus in managing Kubernetes, Docker, and cloud infra. So I have lots of opinions. I put this at the beginning of, of, our, of our conversation here. So brett.show slash DevOps. Um, so that takes you to this issue. This is an AMA in GitHub that um, I try to answer a lot of that. And I send you other places to try to help you answer that. So I would say you need to know a programming language, maybe Python, maybe Golang, um, maybe Node.js. You probably need to learn one of them and learn it. You don't have to be an expert in it, but learn it enough that you can write some basic things, you know, that you understand how to read it. And most importantly, that you understand package managers. I, as a junior DevOps engineer, I would expect you, anyone, to know how apt work works, how yum works, how Docker multi-stage files work for building a, a good, solid production image, um, how NPM works, or whatever the language is my team is, is using. If I'm supporting a team in Ruby, then I've got to know gems and how bundle works, and I need to know all that stuff. If I'm using Node.js, I got to know about node modules and how NPM works. So as a DevOps engineer, I'm the one that's helping them take that code, making sure that it can be tested and it's tested well, making sure that it's automated in that, in that workflow and that it gets to production as fast as we can do it safely and that I monitor and measure all those things. So if you already know how to do all of that, if you know, if you know how to take code from GitHub, get it into a container, have it tested, you know, have it built, have it pushed to a registry, have it, have it security scanned, and then have it automatically pushed to production, that's a DevOps engineer. Like, regardless of what tools you did it with, learning more tools is just learning another tool. But the methodology is what a junior DevOps person needs to really understand. So go read the DevOps handbook. I keep, I, I'm going to just keep saying it because <laughs> it, it's kind of assumed as you get through your career that you've at least read that. Um, because you know, there isn't like a universal, everyone has this one cert to, guarantee that they know DevOps. There are lots of certs with DevOps in their titles or they're associated with DevOps, but um, the DevOps handbook, and then there are more books related to DevOps handbook. If you just go search it on Amazon, um, you know, you'll find other books related and start reading those because those are about your mindset and how, and how you implement the ideas of DevOps. Okay. That's, that's it. All right, we're going to wrap this up. I've been going for almost two hours. Um, let me see if there's any more good questions here that I've missed. And apologies if I missed your question. Uh, it was not intentional. I might have accidentally scrolled past it. Um, working as DevOps means to me constantly learning new stuff while you, are un while you are unlearning. Just have a look into CNCF, which causes vertigo. Yeah, I would agree. Um, there is always new things. So don't be overwhelmed by new things. I am not an expert on all the new things. That's why I have guests on this show. <laughs> I have the guests because they know more than me. Um, so it's more important that you can describe and implement a path from code in Git to things running on servers for your customer. Like if you can do that all by yourself, you're definitely on the road. And then you need to make that path better with better monitoring, better, better logging, you know, centralize that, put it somewhere so people can go find it. Um, put stuff in, put your stuff in open source so other people can learn what you're learning and see what you're doing. Um, because we're, the DevOps world is a world of sharing. It's a world of uh, learning together, not just in your team, but also with others on the internet. So um, with that, I'm going to call it. <laughs> and thank you so much for the questions. I'm going to be here live next week. Um, I don't have a guest scheduled yet, so you'll just have to stay tuned on my, either on the Discord, on a Discord server up there, oops, up there, DevOps fan for the Discord server, 
Join that so you can stay up to date on what's going to happen in the show. Also, check out my Patreon. You can join that for free. You can just follow it for free to get all my updates when I have special guests, when I'm releasing new code. We didn't even talk this week about some of the stuff I'm working on, like this little gym that I'll... No, oh, Siri's talking to me. Um, so go over and check this baby out. This is a big old readme that I made a couple weeks ago. It's all about multi-architecture, multi-platform building of Docker and some of the headaches you might have if you're trying to do that. Um, right now in all my courses, I'm improving all the images so that they will work on Raspberry Pis and ARM M1s for, for Apple M1s, right? Uh, and for ARM on the internet with, with AWS's Graviton processors. So I'm improving all those in all courses so that you'll now be able to run it everywhere that ARM works, hopefully. Um, and that's a lot of work. So I'm learning lots of things and I'm taking my notes and putting them in GitHub because that's what we all are supposed to do is help each other. Um, so go check that out and I will talk more about that maybe next week. We'll see. Um, it depends on whether we have a guest or not. All right. Thank you all. See you next week. Have a good one. Thanks to my patrons. See y'all on the Discord. Bye.